Please be seated. Veuillez vous asseoir. The court is now in session. Je déclare l'audience ouverte. Today, the chamber continues to hear the closing uh, statements in case 002 slash 02, and the floor again will be given to the co-prosecutors. Ms. G. Wong, please pass the attendance of the parties and other individuals to today's proceedings. Greffier. Mr. President, for today's uh, proceedings to hear the closing uh, statements, all parties to this case are present. Except Mr. Pei Ang, the National Lead Co Lawyer for several parties, who informs the Chamber that he will be absent uh, today for personal reasons. Mr. Nguyen Jie is present in the holding cell downstairs. He has waived his right to be present in the courtroom. The waiver has been delivered to the graffiti. Thank you, Mr. President. President, thank you, Ms. Ji Siu-Hua. The Chamber now decides on the request by Nguyen Chia. The Chamber has received a waiver from Nguyen Chia, dated 15 June 2017, which states that due to his health, that he's had headache, back pain, he cannot sit or concentrate for long, and in order to effectively participate in future hearings, he requests to waive his right to be present at the 15 June 2017 hearing. Having seen the medical report of Nguyen Chi by the duty doctor for the accused at the ECCC dated 15 June 2017, which notes that today Nguyen Chi feels dizzy and has a constant lower back pain and recommends that the chamber shall grant him his request so that he can follow the proceedings remotely from the holding cell downstairs. Based on the above information and pursuant to Rule 81.5 of the ECCC internal rules, the Chamber grants Anunji his request to follow today's proceedings remotely from the holding cell downstairs via an audiovisual means. The Chamber instructs the AV unit personnel to link the proceedings to the room downstairs so that Anunji can follow. That applies for the whole day. And I'd like now to give the floor to the International Deputy Co-Prosecutor to continue with the closing statements. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning, Council parties. Um, when we broke yesterday, uh, I was discussing uh, the crime of imprisonment uh, and the uh, deprivation of liberty uh, of thousands of people at these security offices uh, without any due process. And I want to turn um, to a, a subject that Je comes up uh, over sujet. and over uh, when you look at the evidence relating to uh, arrests uh, of people uh, sent to the Democratic Campuchia security offices, uh, and that is the use, uh, the use of confessions from S21, as we will discuss later, torture-induced confessions that name or implicate people uh, as the basis for arrests. At Okansang, uh, we heard um, from the prison chief, Chan Se, uh, and his deputy, Chin Kim Tong, who both testified uh, that confessions were sent from Phnom Penh uh, to the Division 801 Secretary, Sar Sarun, who used the alias Rune, and that the division soldiers named in those confessions were arrested uh, and sent to the division prison in Okansang. And we see confirmation of their testimony in uh, a surviving S21 confession 
which contains a handwritten note from San Sen to the division secretary room asking him to review the confession and to pick out the names, the relevant names from 801. We also see a corroboration of this in a 29 March 1977 report, E3 1060, a report from the division secretary to San Sen, which states, quote, we were following the trail of both new and old elements destroying the revolution. Those targets included those going against the revolutionary line and those newly and previously implicated by the enemy. We saw the same uh, evidence at Phnom Krao, Sector 105. A cadre uh, from there, a high-ranking cadre who was interviewed by OCIJ, uh, but passed away uh, before this trial, uh, saw confessions um, that had been sent uh, to the Sector 105 military chief. And in this uh, surviving telegram from Sector Secretary Sao Sarun uh, to the leaders in Phnom Penh, uh, which concerned uh, the chairman of a repair factory, uh, comrade Sot, uh, who had committed a moral act with a woman, uh, resulting in the arrest of both persons. Sarun noted that Comrade Sot had been previously implicated in the responses of the contemptible traitor Chun. And he asked for instructions from the center on what to do with him. And you should note uh, in this telegram uh, there is a handwritten note in the upper left margin uh, indicating that this document was specifically forwarded to Noon Che. Uh, in his testimony uh, in this court, Your Honors, uh, Sao Sarun admitted uh, sending this telegram. <coughs> he admitted he had received from the center the names of Sector 105 cadres who had been implicated in the S-21 confession of Chun. Chun had been the head of the sector commerce office. He claimed uh, that the instruction he got back from Phnom Penh was to release Comrade Sot. But we saw in this trial that that was not true. You heard from two uh, witnesses from that sector, Chan Tok and Bon Lung Choi, uh, who both knew Comrade Sot. He was a well-known uh, leader in that sector in charge of the workforces and the brother of the sector military chief. And they both testified that, contrary to what you heard from Sao Sarun, Sot disappeared from Mondulkiri and was never seen again. I want to mention uh, also uh, uh, another event we heard uh, during the Phnom Krao uh, segment. Uh, you may remember uh, Ban Lung Choi testified uh, about a group of men who fled uh, one of the commerce offices for Vietnam. Their wives, however, did not flee with them. They stayed behind. And the reward for that as we saw, it was a trip to S21. In regards to S21, Your Honors, there are, of course, uh, many, many documents. Uh, let me show you one uh, where we say, see the same use of confessions as the basis for arrests. Uh, this is a May 1977 letter uh, from Division 310 uh, that plainly states uh, seven people were sent to S21 
because their names and activities were mentioned in confession records. And that document, Your Honors, uh, E3 1050. The arbitrary uh, and extrajudicial nature of arrests uh, is also seen uh, in a letter I'd like to read to you uh, that was sent by uh, a member of the committee of the Campensam Court to Doik uh, on the 1st of June. Uh, 1977, uh, regarding a cadre from the North Zone who was being sent uh, to S21. Uh, this is document E3-1155. And it is revealing, uh, very revealing, uh, about the arbitrariness of this regime. Uh, the letter states, to miss, a, miss and beloved comrade Doig, Today, I transferred a person called Born to you. The contemptible person is from the North Zone office with contemptible Tuch. His wife is the same. He is a friend of contemptible Ni in the commerce section. He was transferred because of his activities, as mentioned below. When he drove, he dr braked until the tires dragged 10 to 20 meters. Once, he took a small excavator used for lifting goods to tow a big truck. It could not tow the truck, so he accelerated the engine until the engine became very hot. And his last act, he drove the excavator down the mountain and did not use the brake. He dropped a shovel to drag on the road instead of using the brake. So the suspension is broken because the shovel hit and dragged along the road. When he removed it for repair, the suspension oil gushed out. With revolutionary déversé. fraternal respect, respect, signed by Crin. Avec, uh, signé Crin. Your, your honors, uh, what we see here uh, in the Khmer Rouge era, being Monsieur a lousy Chien, driver ici, was enough of a reason Rouge, for the party to send you to S21. This is why courts and judicial process is necessary before we deprive people of their liberty. And while the content of this letter is almost humorous, the end of the story is not. This hapless driver, a platoon chief, Srang, Srang alias Vorn, was sent to S21 on the 1st of June 1977, and less than three weeks later uh, was sent out for execution. He is number 4315 for your reference on the OCIJ S21 list. And his execution uh, record E3-2285. Uh, things were not any better at Krang Tachan. In one of the surviving lists uh, from that prison uh, that identifies 29 prisoners, uh, this is part of E3-4083, there are 29 prisoners. Uh, the first 20 are mostly former Lonol soldiers who are described as being arrested because they were part of a network that planned to escape to Vietnam or Thailand. The next seven prisoners on the list had the misfortune of breaking either spoons or hose in their cooperatives. Number 28 complained that no one should eat thin porridge. 
And number 29 was a 73-year-old former village chief who took food to eat. Un ancien chef de village âgé de 73 ans qui avait pris de la nourriture pour en manger. Now, uh, as you'll see in this slide um, that was filed uh, in the annexes to our trial brief of uh, figure 1.5, uh, approximately half of the documented Prang Tachan prison population were former soldiers, officials, or police from the Khmer Republic regime. Uh, this is based on uh, our review of Prang Tachan records, and it's the same conclusion that both Meng Tri Yi and Henri Lucard arrived at when they reviewed the surviving uh, records. Your honors heard a testimony from Riel San uh, on the instructions given by the Tramcock District Committee to identify and purge former law no who held ranking positions. And the second chart, figure 1.6 in our annexes, shows that almost three quarters of the former Law No soldiers imprisoned at Prang Tachan held the rank of warrant officer, adjutant, or higher. Now, on this issue of the purge of former law no uh, regime soldiers or officials, the, the defense offered a contrary uh, witness on this issue, Mr. Sao Ban. Remember, however, he is someone who left Tram Kok early in the regime. His story is also rather undermined by the fact his own brother was a former law no soldier who was arrested and imprisoned for much of the regime. But an, any dispute, Your Honors, any dispute among the witness testimony as to what the policy was in Tramcock is resolved by the surviving records from communes and the district that clearly document an instruction and policy uh, to purge former law no officers. I presented those documents to your honors before, uh, so today I will just quickly remind you of two of them. This is an April 1977 report from Ching Torn Commune that refers to the successive instructions from Ankar to purge enemy officers and goes on to identify a number of such persons. And the second document is a May 1977 report from Popol Commune, which states that 106 households, a total of 393 people in that commune, of former, long, former military personnel had already been smashed. And the commune was still screening families to see if they could find more. Your honors, uh, arresting and imprisoning individuals because they or a relative uh, held a position in or supported the former regime is not due process, it is persecution. Plain and simple. Membres de leur famille, occupés des fonctions sous l'ancien régime ou soutenus l'ancien régime. Also in regards uh, to Crank to Chan, uh, the very first Toujours witness uh, who testified in this trial over two years ago uh, was Miyasoka. Uh, almost his entire family was arrested and imprisoned at Crank to Chan for years because his father and his brother-in-law dared to try to vote out the local village chief. His testimony is corroborated by multiple uh, records from the prison confirming those arrests, such as this uh, May 1978 list of prisoners detained for months or years, signed by Crank Tachan prison chief on that includes Miyasoka's mother and sister and references the execution of his father and brother-in-law. 
ainsi que des informations sur l'exécution And incidentally, de ce number four uh, on the same, very same list is Vaughn Saroon, the female medic uh, who testified at the end of the Krang Tachan segment about her detention uh, and the de detention of her young child at Krang Tachan. And if we go back and look at the same list, uh, the note in the right column for her uh, and her colleague, Uch Han, states, the two women were implicated by Hong, a worker in Hospital 22. Your Honours, just because a co-worker, probably broken by torture or fear, named her in a confession, Vaughn Saroon and her young child spent one and a half years in Krang Tachan. And let me now address the inhumane conditions that she and the others detained at the security offices had to endure. On this subject, uh, I will discuss uh, the four prisons together. Uh, as the evidence you have heard um, uh, shows a clear and consistent picture of what life was like for those branded as enemies and sent to the security offices. There are five facts or truths about the inhumane conditions suffered by de detainees that are common to all of these security offices. Number one, prisoners were shackled in their cells. Number two, the prisoners had to relieve themselves while shackled in their cells. Number three, hygiene was non-existent. Number four, the prisoners did not receive sufficient food. And number five, the prisoners often became ill, did not receive proper medical care, and many died. Let me briefly address the evidence proving each of these facts. With respect to the use of shackles, you have heard how prisoners were shackled by the ankle in their cells day and night, other than the few uh, who were treated as light prisoners and given work assignments in the prison grounds. At the big prisons, the shackles were attached to long metal bars, and the prisoners laid on the ground in rows, as we saw in that painting from a prisoner Van Nat. In this photograph, you see the shackles that were used on prisoners left behind at S21 and also at Krang Tachan. And in our next photograph, Sur la prochaine photo, if we go to slide, the next slide, uh, this is a photograph uh, identified by Doik. You see former North Zone Secretary Hoi Tun shackled in the cell in which he was interrogated at the special prison. The Oken Sang prison chief admitted the use of steel and wooden shackles and that serious offense prisoners remained shackled at all times, including when they slept at night. And in regards to Panam Krau, uh, Net Savat described uh, in this courtroom uh, how one day he was taken to the second floor of the K-17 office and saw a Division 920 soldiers uh, detained by the ankles in wooden shackles. Krang Tachan survivor Vorn Saroon described for you the effects of being permanently shackled like this. I quote, I had no strength to walk, and I was also suffering from numbness in my ankles because I was shackled. 
While I was walking to the interrogation room, I did not even feel my legs. A second, your honors, the prisoners at each of these security offices had to urinate and defecate while shackled in their cells into coconut shells, bamboo tubes, ammunition cases, uh, or other such containers that were passed from prisoner to prisoner. As you heard from Chum Mei, they had to eat and sleep in the very same place where they relieved themselves. Fact number three, because of the lack of hygiene, the prisoners were often covered with lice and their cells were infested by bugs and rats. As was described by Van Nat in his book, Cambodian Prison Portrait, Cambodian prison portrait. I quote, Je vais citer. My body began to deteriorate. Mon corps a commencé à se deteriorate. My ribs were poking out and my body Mes was like an old man of 70. Et mon corps ressemblait à my hair was overgrown like bamboo Mes roots and had become a nest for lice. Et était devenu un nid à peau. I had scabies all over my body. Partout sur le corps. My mind and spirit had flown away. Perdu la tête et I only knew one thing clearly, hunger. Je clairement conscience End of quote. Une seule chose, la fin. Fin citation. Civil party Soi Sen, who was imprisoned Soy at Prang Tachan for four years, described the same conditions at that prison. Quote, Dans cette prison. We couldn't stay system. still because there were too many bed bugs and body lice that were biting us. I probably killed millions of bugs by just crushing the ground with the palm of my hand. It bit us so much our skin became numb. A former member of the Krang Tachan Committee, Ip Deutsch, known as Big Deutsch, in Tramcock, described to OCIJ uh, the sight uh, that he saw when he visited Krang Tachan. Quote, when I entered, when the door was open, I smelled the odor and saw all the people. I had them close the door. I did not want to look anymore. Lauren Saroon testified to you that when she first entered her detention building, she could smell death. Fourth, the prisoners at these security offices were fed almost nothing. They were hungry all the time and became weak and emaciated. Son Vut, uh, who was detained Son uh, at a prison in the Phnom Krau area, prison, testified Phnom he did not receive any food the first day he was detained repas, and thereafter received détenu, daily portions of rice that, in his words, were the size of his wrist. Miyasoka described how his mother was not fed enough to produce breast milk, and that two of his younger siblings died a few months after they were detained at Prang Tachan. And in this courtroom in June 2009, Van Nat testified, I quote, the conditions were so inhumane and the food so little. There was a big pot of gruel to be distributed among 50 or 60 of us. So we only had three spoons of gruel for each meal. And the spoon was like a coffee spoon, so little. I lost my dignity because the condition of the prisoners and the guards were so distant. It's like humans compared to animals. 
Even with animals, they would give enough food. I did not think of anything, any other thing than being thirsty and hungry. I was so hungry, I had never experienced that hunger before. And I thought that even eating a human flesh would be a good meal. Fifth, 